I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. This is Book of Mormon Central's Come Follow Me Insights. Today, the creation story, as found in Genesis chapters 1 through 2, Moses 2 through 3, and Abraham chapters 4 through 5. Yeah, so as, as you just introduced, we're, we're, getting, we're getting three lenses, three different angles on this creation story out of the scriptures. Our original Genesis account that the Bible opens with chapters 1 and 2, beginning with this story of the creation, and then we get the JST for Genesis over here in the Pearl of Great Price in Moses chapters 2 through two through three, and then we get an additional account in Abraham four through five. And Taylor, quite frankly, some people get frustrated with this because they say, but wait, there are some differences here compared to there and here, and this one has differences from there. How would you respond? So, I have shared my testimony innumerable times at testimony meeting. If we had recorded every single time I record, had given my testimony, you would find discrepancies or things that were different. And it's always a matter of emphasis. Who am I talking to? What currently is on my mind at that moment? What am I hoping for my audience to experience? And we live in this post-scientific revolution world where we want everything to line up but when God originally revealed the creation stories, he did so for very different purposes than what scientists today might want. We want to have every single word line up, and God's like, actually, the purpose, the original purpose for laying this out, one of the main reasons was to teach people who God is and who we are, and not to answer these scientific questions. Yeah, yeah this is, if you're looking to, to Genesis chapters 1 and 2, or Moses 2 and 3, or Abraham 4 to 5, looking for exact scientific blueprints for how the creation took place, you're going to spend a lot of time uh, spinning wheels and going nowhere, because these accounts aren't really trying to answer the how. They're trying to answer predominantly, and, and you, you might read this differently, but from my perspective, they're answering two questions, largely. Who? Who is God? Who are we? how does that relationship fit, and why? Why did he create the earth for us? Why, why do we even exist? Why are we here? If you're just looking for those two things, this is a great adventure. And then, with modern revelation, we get a fourth view that we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about in this particular episode, but modern temple worship involves a great deal of, of creation elements and telling the creation story, and there are some fairly significant differences in some of the order of the events, and it's beautiful to have this four-dimensional view of the creation. So, Another way to look at this is imagine um, theater, where you go to see a story unfold, and the creation story is like the stage and the props, because the Bible was revealed so God could lay out his plan of salvation. And you have to set the stage for where that narrative or that play or where that story will occur. And so I'm not trying to diminish the, the creation story, but in some ways it's the props that set up the stage. And if you showed up to theater and you spent all your time fixating on the props or debating the placement of the props are like, the last time I saw this play, that tree was over here. We actually missed the whole point of the play or the show, which is God's salvation of his people. That's what he's trying to do. And it's significant that if you look at the totality of the Old Testament, how little time God actually spends on the creation story. It's a significant element, but he could have spent thousands of pages just on the creation story. But instead, he wants to set the stage so we can understand who he is, who we are, and why this earth was created to assist in our salvation. So we hope that perspective can help you as you consider these different accounts that give us different perspectives, basically different angles in that theater of looking at the same stage, but seeing it from a different perspective of what is God trying to do in this story of salvation, and what's my role in it? And actually, one more final thought. If you think about the temple, 
two of the key characters that shows up in the creation story are Adam and Eve. And we are invited to imagine ourselves in the plan of salvation as an Adam or as an Eve. And this way, it's a bit more particip participatory and interactive. And so instead of us just being passive and just watching the plan of salvation working out, God is asking us, almost as audience members, to come up on stage and we get to be part of this grand play of salvation. So as we step back for just a few feet and look at this, it's important to remember that what we're putting in place today with these particular scriptures as we study them this week is the first of three pillars that uphold the entire plan of salvation that were put in place long before the foundation of the world. Before we even create the world, God sets these three things in place, the creation, the fall of Adam and Eve, and the infinite atonement of Jesus Christ. Those three pillars are put in place and prepared for and planned out with blueprints, it's, it's all designed, and now we can begin. Now that we have everything in, or in, in order, we can now create the earth. So as we begin, um, I, let, let's model something for you. There's the account in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We're just going to do one verse here as an as a example. So you get the biblical account of what Joseph Smith had to work with originally when he's making his JST modifications, and you're going to contrast that then with chapter 2 over here, verse 1. So obviously this one's pretty simple. It's in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's it. That's what Joseph is, is starting with. But what he writes in Moses chapter 2, verse 1 is, and it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, remember, this comes on the heels of what came last week that we talked about, Moses chapter 1. This, what we love to call the, the grand prologue to the whole scriptural story, the, the whole canon kind of begins with this sweeping cosmic uh, vision that Moses has had and that we've lost. So now we pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 2 again. It came to pass the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, I reveal unto you concerning this heaven and this earth, write the things which I speak. I am the beginning and the end, the Almighty God. By mine only begotten I created these things. Yea, now here's your crossover, in the beginning I created the heaven and the earth upon which thou standest. So you're seeing there's, a, there's an awful lot that gets added to that verse, a lot of context that God the Father is talking about doing this creation through his only begotten Son, which he had mentioned in great detail back in chapter 1. As if you read verse 32 again, back in chapter 1, by the word of my power have I created these worlds without number, which is mine only begotten Son. So it's, it's a powerful reminder, yet again, of where Jesus Christ fits in this first pillar of the plan of our Heavenly Father for our salvation. You notice he talks about being the beginning and the end, right? He creates this in order to save us, to create this one eternal round where we're wrapped into this covenantal relationship with him. It's beautiful, those analogies of beginning and end, the alpha and the omega that you're going to get in the New Testament, this, the first and the last letter of that Greek alphabet, which, by the way, just as a side note, um, doesn't that give us an opportunity to have greater hope for the future if we make a little um, play on the words here? I'm the beginning and the end. It's one of his titles, and if you stop and think about one of the attributes of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's, it's to have faith in Christ, trust him, it's to repent of our sins, it's to get baptized, it's to get the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then it's to endure to the, to the end. It's interesting if you think about one way that that works in English. It doesn't translate well into any other language, but in English it's beautiful to say 
wait, it's not just a matter of me gutting my way through a miserable life until I get to the end, enduring to the end in a slog kind of fashion, it's actually today enduring in my faith and my covenant path progression, enduring to Jesus. It's connecting me to Christ. One of his titles is, I am the beginning and the end, and if I'm enduring to the end, I'm enduring to Christ. I'm holding on to him today. It's not just a matter of saying, if I can just get my way through life, then I get this grand reward at the end. I, I love the way that this plays out along the process of life to say, I'm going nowhere that matters today or tomorrow or next week or next year without the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he is the only means whereby I can hope to endure in anything, in any aspect of life. I love that, Tyler. I want to give an additional perspective here that when we actually read the Old Testament from the Old Testament perspective, instead of the 21st century scientific perspective, we actually see a grander view of what God is doing. For example, we actually get this in, in the book of Abraham, that the word create here in Hebrew also has a sense of organizing, bringing things that are in chaotic disorder into order. And as we go through these passages, you'll notice how God is separating opposites that have been commingled into chaotic disorder, and he's ordering the world. So part of what God does is when he does creation, he's actually organizing, putting order. So that's the first thought, is the creation story is about organizing. Second thought is the, the creation story is the answer to what question? So we often have scientific questions, but when God originally revealed this, people were not asking the scientific questions we ask today. So if we actually understand the questions that people had, then we can read this with, I think, greater awareness and understanding and personal value. And it's, again, God wanting to reveal who he is, who we are, and why this is all happening. And it's actually the seven days seem to be patterned on an ancient temple um, dedication plan, where there was a seven-day dedicatory service. And on the seventh day, the king would rest from all his labors, and everybody would be resting from their labors of preparing the temple for, for God to be there and to be holy. So if you read the creation story through that lens, it's also very interesting through the temple perspective. And then finally, the third thing that might be helpful if we look at the ancient perspective, the ancient Israelite perspective, um, in their world, in their time, existence was brought about by things being given a name with a purpose and a function. It's really interesting. When we think about existence today, we think about materiality and that it's got atoms or, and molecules. And certainly God made use of all those things. But in the storytelling that God revealed uh, in the creation story to his people anciently, he was helping them to see the purpose and function of the world in their salvation. So I want to make this really clear. In the ancient world, for the ancient Israelites, for them, existence happened when something had purpose and function, and that purpose and function had a name. So as you're reading the creation story, look at actually how God names things. He says things like, let there be light. You might notice in the creation story, the sun and the moon and stars are actually created after this time. We might think from a scientific standpoint, how can there be light if there's no sun, moon, and stars? But if you think about it from ancient Israelite perspective, um, as God's trying to reveal to them that he is the source of light. He is the one who brings it into being, and he gives it purpose and function, and the name conveys that. So those two things, look for purpose and function, and then look for how names are used to tell doctrinal stories that can matter to our lives. So let's dive in with the creation events that are outlined here. And as we jump in for these different days that are listed, it's important to note that you and I use the word day to generally denote a 24-hour passage of time on our, on our clocks today. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, clear back in 1982 in the Enzyme, 
he says, quote, what is a day? It is a specified time period. It's an age, an eon, a division of eternity. It is the time between two identifiable events, and each day of whatever length has the duration needed for its purposes. There is no revealed recitation specifying that each of the six days involved in the creation was of the same duration. Did you catch that? He just said there, there's nothing in the record that would say that these are equal time markers through the story. They're just the beginning and the end of a creative period that was uh, designated by God. Then he goes on to say, the Mosaic and Abrahamic accounts place the creative events on the same successive days. So the Mosaic and Abrahamic would be Genesis and Moses, as well as Abraham, they line up with what happened on day one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the resting on day seven. But listen to this, Elder McConkie in that same uh, article says, the temple account, for reasons that are apparent to those familiar with its teachings, has a different division of events. It seems clear that the six days are one continuing period and that there is no one place where the dividing lines between the successive events must of necessity be placed. He's What Elder McConkie is saying here is what, what Taylor introduced earlier is this is like a stage production and we get, we get the script and different directors and different producers and different stage managers and costume designers can take that exact same script and they can portray it quite differently in different settings. It's the same script, but let's not get too caught up as we go through these days in the, in the minutiae, in the, in the fine-tuned detail. But there are some principles to be gained along the way. So we're going to begin with day one, in, and we're going to take it through originally Moses chapter 2. So we'll start in verse 1 through 5. This is day 1, which can kind of seem confusing to people because you're thinking he's creating um, light and other things. What he says is in verse 2, the earth was without form and void, and I caused darkness to come up upon the face of the deep, and my spirit moved upon the face of the water, for I am God. It's an interesting statement. You have this, this earth that is without form, it's void, there's no life on it, it's just the, the elements are there, and it's filled with darkness, but the spirit moved upon the face of the water. Huh. I wonder, I wonder if there could be any connection between what's happening with the earth here and what happens with us as God's children at times, when we end up in chaos, when we end up um, going astray, either a little bit or a lot, that idea of his spirit moving over us, brooding over us, kind of preparing the way to bring into higher order, a higher state of being, that which has, has gone into chaos. And for any of you who are into science, you know that the, the one absolute constant out in the universe of science is entropy and this disorder, disorder this, this chaos, this, this trend towards greater, greater disorder, greater uh, chaotic situations until God gets involved and then he brings higher order, which by the way is so fascinating because when Joseph Smith comes on the scene, in the 19th century, you get this, um, this really, really strong debate in that day that isn't new in Joseph's day. It's been going on for decades, for hundreds of years up to this point to one degree or another. It's a debate between two polar opposites, and it's one that says creationism ex nihilo is what happened with the earth, that God stood up as if he has a magic wand, and he waves that magic wand and says with the power of his word alone, let there be an earth, and boom, out of nothing. That's what ex nihilo means. Creationism ex nihilo is creation out of nothing. It's just, it's there. 
That's one side of the argument on the creation side in Joseph's day, and the other side is um, evolution without the influence of a heavenly being, without a creator. And Joseph comes on the scene and and the doctrine he teaches says, uh, you're both wrong. And Taylor already mentioned it from the Abraham account, we don't ever use this idea of creation out of nothing, it's God organized the heavens and the earth. He brings things together not terribly unlike a cook going into a kitchen with a whole bunch of ingredients that are scattered and separate, and, and none of them taste really good in isolation, but a really gifted cook knows how to take just the right amount of this and just the right amount of that and that and a dash of this and put them together in the right sequence and provide enough of the resources to, to combine them in the right ways and put them in the right form and put them in the right temperature for the right amount of time to pull them out and let them cool, and now all of a sudden we've, we've organized something, we've created something, but it wasn't created out of nothing, it was organized from matter that was already in existence in the world, and that's a powerful concept as we, as we begin our journey through here is that God's using the resources that are available in the universe to accomplish this. Well, that's a really interesting metaphor that the cook, a cook actually even might watch until the ingredients obey his will to make something. And also the invitation that as children of God, he's invited all of us to be creators with him, to overcome disorder, to put order into the world, to help bring more light and goodness by taking the time to provide purpose and function, named purpose and function for what's already in the world, to do something new that's never been done before. So if you look in your life, your desire to do something is that creative spark that comes from God to put order where there might be disorder, to bring a little bit of light, to help the world to be a little less fallen, to spread forth God's kingdom one step at a time. That's beautiful. It's, it's that any situation that you go in where you see chaos or disorder and you help bring it to a higher state of being, mommies do this every day, all the time. Um, leaders in the church do this all the time. They're trying to find ways to bring greater order and stability to people's lives. You do it every time you go and clean a room, not just when you bake or cook. You do it when you help a child or when you teach. You're taking ideas that are kind of scattered and random and messy and you're bringing them together so people can say, ah, I see how it fits. You're creating. Um, or if you're just listening to somebody. Right? You listen to them and they have this, this chaotic thinking and they talk through it, they're like, oh, I think I understand what's going on in my brain right now. Or a painter who takes a whole bunch of paints that in isolation, they're not beautiful, but they figure out the right way to put those together and bring order. And isn't it amazing that God's children ha all have implanted within us these these desires, these drives to create, to, to, to build things, architecture, not just on canvas, but in, in buildings, in dance, in symphonies, and in music productions. We're, we're taking that which is uh, disordered and we're making it beautiful, all as a reflection of this much bigger, this astronomically big creation project that we're talking about going through. I'm going to add one more thing to this before you erase it. Um, the word or oh, green, I should not use green. The word ordinance, <laughs> there we go. Did I spell that right? Mm -hmm. Ordinance comes from the word order. So there, there's chaos in our lives, spiritual, physical, otherwise. God has revealed ordinances to provide order. It's actually the creation is still unfolding. Now, I want you to rem remember every week, every seventh day, we all rest 
and participate in the order of sacrament so that the chaos of our lives is just put aside for just a bit. We've had these, well, periods of chaos, essentially. We get down to day seven, and God allows us to put our lives back in order through the ordinance of sacrament, which is focused on his only begotten, who was the one who actually created everything that we have. Beautiful. Now let's jump in to the rest of day one. So the earth is organized, it's brought together, it's without form, it's void. And then in verse 3 it says, And I, God, said, Let there be light. And there was light. And I, God, called the light day, and the darkness I called night. And this I did by the word of my power. And it was done as I spake. And the evening and the morning were the first day. By the way, this won't get any of you into heaven. You, you won't be asked this question on any final exam at the pearly gates, I don't think. Um, but it's fascinating that in an ancient Hebrew perspective, this is why to this day Jewish people and many of the um, Middle Eastern religions, they start their new day at sundown in the evening because of this concept here. You'll notice how it worded it. It said, it was done as I spake, and the evening and the morning were the first day. The first thing mentioned in the day was the evening. So as soon as the sun sets, we now flip our calendar to the new day. And you see that in our culture even carried over, not for the same reason. Um, we don't flip our calendars in a Western world until midnight, but on December 24th, when it goes evening, we call it Christmas Eve. Um, on December 31st, we call it New Year's Eve. Um, October 31st is All Hallowed's Eve, because the next day is All Saints' Day or All Hallowed's Day, November 1st. The day you're supposed to remember the, your honored ancestors That's who right. passed on. That's right. So we still have elements of this tradition um, permeating some of the things that we do. Uh, so we begin our new day at that evening, go in through the night, and we call it day one. So day two, or the second time period, is the shortest one by far. It only covers three verses here, from verse six to verse eight, and it's where he, he talks about, let there be a firmament in the midst of the water, and it was so. The, the word firmament, to us, feels like firm, mm -hmm. something that's the process of making something firm, steadfast, immovable. It sounds like a foundation. Another word would be like actually like a vault. Yeah, the, the word in Hebrew is more of an expanse or a covering. It's a, from, again, Taylor's mentioned this before, we can't read these ancient accounts through 21st century lenses with 21st century uh, sensitivities to science and what we know from satellites and from trips out into space and our views of the atmosphere. Um, yeah, we know that there's not a brick wall stopping satellites from getting out there or rocket ships. It's basically just air. Yeah, so, so what you have is to the ancients they see the earth and you've got water on the face of the earth and then there's water up in the firmament. And beyond the firmament are the sun, moon, and the stars, and we'll get to those in a minute. But that was their view. This expanse of heaven was like a dome. And the water is up here, and every now and then, the windows of heaven would be open, and all this water would pour out. That's called rain. Or sometimes you see water shooting out of the ground, like in geysers or rivers. And so they believed that the water was also underneath. And what's interesting here is that God does not correct the ancient Israelite scientific misconception of how the world is arranged. He didn't take the time to say, hey, everybody, I know this is like 4,000 years earlier than what you guys really need to hear, but let me tell you how atoms work and actually really where all the rain comes from. He doesn't do that. He focuses on working within their understanding of how they thought the world worked, revealing himself to them within a framework that made sense to them. So sometimes today we get a little confused because we have the scientific revolution going back 400 years. We now realize there's not just a bunch of water sitting there above some brick vault 
and then every now and then the windows, windows open, open and pour down. down. We know that's not the case. But we still have these ancient revealed texts that God gave to his ancient saints to convince them of who he was. So if we can listen through their perspective, we perhaps might get more meaning for us today instead of just frustration like, why would God reveal these things in a way that doesn't fit with science? Because he cared more about people knowing him than he cared about what we might call scientific accuracy. Wonderful. So we close day two. Ironically, the, the one day that God doesn't pronounce it good, it's, it's kind of one of those funny things where you get every day is pronounced good and day three is going to be twice blessed, but day two didn't get the it is good label, and I don't know that I would read too much into that other than it's, it's a fairly simple process from their perspective of what's happening as we divide the waters between the earth and up in the sky. Now we get to day three, verse 9 through 13, where he's gathering water together and causing dry land to appear, and he calls the water seas and the dry land he calls earth. And you'll notice at the bottom of verse 10, you could mark this, God saw that all which I had made, all these things which, which he had made were good. So there's your first good in day three, and then he brings forth all of these plants, the, the flora of the earth, the grass, the herb yielding seed, the fruit tree, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed should be in itself upon the earth, and it was so even as I spake. And you'll notice at the end of verse 12 that God saw that all these things which he had made were good. There it is again. So it is the, it is the twice blessed day. There are some, not all, but there are some Jewish traditions today that hearken back to that where they see Tuesday, because this is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday on their calendar, they, say to, they see Tuesday in some traditions as this twice-blessed day. Many of them will try to get married on those days or have um, celebrations on that day, um, see it as kind of this extra-blessed day of the Lord. I want to just share again this perspective of the importance of purpose and function and names, and notice that how God gives names to these things. Now, we're so familiar with these words, we may not think much of it, because something's called the earth when we get that. Um, if we were listening to this in Hebrew or reading it in Hebrew, we'd actually see some interesting word plays going on that eventually Adam gets created, and the word earth, the word for earth and the word for Adam actually both come from essentially the same root word. And the fact that actually he calls it good is to suggest that we actually are built from the earth, from the dust, but we also are good. Our creation is good. Now, let me just share just a perspective on this. If you're an ancient Israelite, you're familiar with from other cultures around you, the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, there are these polytheistic pagan societies who have lots of gods they worship, and they have their own creation stories. It's interesting, in those creation stories, particularly the Mesopotamian creation stories, um, when they talk about humans being created, they talk about humans being created from the blood of a rebellious god who lost in a, in a civil war among the gods. Think about that. What does it say about humans? They're basically just the, the bloody offspring of rebellion. And look at what we're going to see here in this text, that humans actually are the offspring or the creation of God himself and not some rebellious god. It's, that, that's a beautiful um, concept to remember is that Everything we're talking about in the creation are things that God has organized and brought together, but there is a significant difference between all of God's creations or creatures and God's children. You know, I look, I look at my own family situation and there are a lot of things in my home that my wife and I have built and our family has built and created in our home, but none of those things have my DNA and my wife's DNA in them. None of those things have the capacity or the agency to act and to grow and to learn intelligently and to become more like their parents and ultimately more like God. So, with all of the beauties and the wonders of the creation, it's important, I think, to note from a scriptural perspective, we have incredible responsibility as God's children to take care of all of the rest 
of these things that we're talking about in the creative process, to not see see them as as things that can be um, abused or or destroyed at will for our own benefit, but rather this responsibility. We'll, we'll come back to that a little share, bit later. And I'll just share one more brief story because we're talking about plants. A few years ago, I asked a plant specialist at a university, I'm like, can I take a class from you to learn plant names? And he said, actually, I have something better. I have an app called Seek, S-E-E-K, which you turn it on and you point your phone, your camera at any living object and it actually will identify what it is. Well, a few weeks later, I was biking in Bryce Canyon National Park in uh, Utah with my family and literally about every 10 yards, I was stopping and getting off my bike because there was this profusion of wildflowers. And I'd pull out my phone and I would actually look at the flower through the phone and find out exactly what the name of that flower was, its life cycle, when it typically blooms, and what it's related to. And I think I learned the names of 30 new flowers in just about an hour. So my daughter and I kept just stopping and looking. My wife's like, what's taking you guys so long to do this bike ride? It was interesting to me. I came to love these flowers because I knew their names. And it dawned on me, you cannot love what you do not know. And you cannot know what doesn't have a name. And if you don't know the name of something, you can't be in relationship with it. And I love how God gives names to everything he creates, a purpose and a function. And he knows you by name. That I find absolutely beautiful. The, the love I felt for these flowers that I had never seen before, now I know their names, I realized God knows me by name. And if I feel this love for a flower that I just met, and now I know its name, how might God actually feel about me, who he's known forever? And he's known my name long before I knew my own name. So God knows you. You have a name. And this creation story is for you. Beautiful. So day four, according to the scriptural accounts, all three of them, Genesis, Moses, and Abraham, talks about God creating the sun, the moon, and the stars. The greater light, it says, was the sun, and it would rule the day, and the lesser light was the moon, and it would rule over the night. So it's fascinating that in those three scriptural accounts we get the plant kingdom created in day three, and then the celestial bodies giving light to the earth in day four. Back maybe in, in the ancient Hebrew times, that wasn't a big deal to them, as Taylor's been talking in a post-scientific world where we, where we understand a little better the, the microbiology and the photosynthesis elements, you can see why it might make a little more sense to swap those two days as far as the, the, the need for the sun to be created probably before those plants. Which now brings us to day five, which takes us from verse 20 down to verse 23. And here is where he's creating, beginning with the animals in the waters, the whales, and then the winged fowl after his kind, and all these animals are blessed in verse 23, or sorry, in verse 22, to be fruitful and to multiply and fill the waters in the sea and let the fowl multiply in the earth, and the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And then you'll notice it's at the beginning of the sixth day, so 24 through 31, where in the scripture account you get this crossover where he then creates the cattle and the beasts upon the face of the land, and after we're done with all of those, these, these bigger animals, God saw that all these things were good, and then he begins the most important part of the creation from our perspective, verse 26, I God said unto mine only begotten, which was with me from the beginning, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and it was so. So now we get Adam created in the image of God the Father and God the Son after their likeness, after their image. Their essence, their similitude. And I want to read the next verse here. And I, God, created man in mine own image, in the image of mine only begotten, created I him, male 
and female created I them. Now, again, if we're ancient Israelites, we're familiar with the surrounding cultures that we live in. And in these other cultures, people would worship their gods by actually creating images of the gods. And the idea was, it wasn't that the image was the god, but it was actually kind of the essence of the god or the representation of the god. And if you're an ancient Israelite knowing that this is what people do, they want the god in their midst, and so they actually create a statue to remind themselves that God is with us, and then suddenly they're revealed this mind-blowing revelation. It's the reverse. I, you are my image. Like, wait, 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 gods don't make images. Humans make images of the gods to make sure that these all pagan, those pagan gods can be with us wherever we go, and God has completely reversed this and told these ancient Israelites, you are my divine image, which is why you find throughout the Old Testament God telling people, don't make images. Don't make images. It's my job to make images, and it's to make you guys like me. That's beautiful, this idea of, of God creating the image of God. You don't need an idol for God because you're looking at what God created to remind us. It's mind-blowing. It's just, it's just com comparing from the culture they were in, it's just so revelatory. I just think it would have been a massive thrill for these ancient Israelites to have this, these truths revealed to them. Okay, now we jump into chapter 3 of Moses. So we begin, so this one's a little different, day seven, because it's in chapter three of the book of Moses, and verse one through three, you get the seventh day, which is this day of rest. So it would be the Saturday on our calendars today, which is beautiful because for all of those Old Testament prophets and those people, they would rest on the Sabbath on Saturday because they are commemorating the greatest event of all time from anybody's perspective up to that point. And the only thing that could possibly cause us to want to move the Sabbath worship is if there's an event that might be even more mind-blowing and more significant to our eternal progression than the creation itself. Well, you had the big, you had the creation, Fall. Fall, atonement, the beginning and the end. And when Jesus Christ raises from the dead, when he, when he arises from that, from that dead state in the tomb and he steps out on that Sunday morning, that first Easter morning, that's why Christians today, many Christians today, not all, but many Christians today now have our day of rest on the first day of the week, not the seventh day of the week because we're commemorating what to us now is the single greatest uh, event in the history of the universe from our perspective, which is the culmination of the infinite atonement with Jesus' resurrection, with the Savior's resurrection on that first Easter morning on Sunday. As a reminder, for the ancient Israelites, when they heard this story, it reminded them of a typical temple dedication that would take place over seven days, where everybody's part invited to participate in removing the chaos, right? You've got to build a building and get everything ready to go. There's just a lot of work. And on the seventh day, the king enters the temple as God's representative and pronounces all is good and everyone can be at rest. And the point here is that God is the king of this world. He wants the world to be at a place of order and not disorder. And symbolically, it takes seven days of effort. And any time anybody rebels against God or causes disorder, it breaks, it breaks the system and you have to reset and get the temple rededicated again and go through that seven-day process of the temple being ready for the king or God to enter into it. So again, as you read this creation story, think about it from the temple perspective, that God is preparing his earthly abode as a representation of his heavenly abode to invite all of us in, to be finally at rest, to go no more out, and no more to be experiencing the fallen nature of disorder. It's beautiful. Now, you'll notice that as you get into Genesis 1 and then Genesis 2, and here in Moses 2 and Moses 3, that in these accounts it says, after we've gone through all of this, then it notifies us, look at verse 5, 
every plant of the field before it was in the earth, every herb of the field before it grew, for I the Lord created all things of which I have spoken spiritually before they were naturally upon the face of the earth. For I the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the face of the earth, and I the Lord God had created all the children of men, and not yet a man to till the ground. And you're saying, wait a minute, I thought we just created Adam back there at the end of chapter 2, and now he's saying, I haven't yet caused it to rain, I've created all the children of men, but not yet a man to till the ground. So we realize that there are these two creations. There's a spiritual creation, and then there's the physical creation. It's not unlike any architect today who doesn't just go and build a building. They generally plan it out step by step by step all along the way before they ever pick up a single piece of wood and a hammer or lay any kind of foundation. They already have a picture of what it's going to look like and how to get from this flat ground or, or whatever soil you're working with to that finished product. So I love this in our own life that it gives us hope in our relationships, it gives us hope in our work, in our careers, whatever those careers are, this idea that with the help of the Lord we can, we can map things out, we can, we can see where we're trying to get and we can figure out the best possible way to get there with the help of the Lord, and then we begin the actual process of doing it. It's powerful on the pathway of discipleship to recognize that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the ultimate builder. Uh, he, he's already laid out the blueprints for us in scriptures and from the words of the living prophets. We, we don't have to make this up as we're going along. We don't have to try to figure out what a faith-filled life on the covenant path looks like blindly. He's given us lots and lots of resources to work with in now carrying out our discipleship, because the spiritual creation is already set in place for us. So look at verse 7. I, the Lord God, formed man from the dust of the ground. So now it's a physical creation out of the dust. Taylor's talked about this word in the past, dust being the same root as earth and Adam. We're, we're, we're all, we were all formed out of the dust of the ground being taken, isn't that interesting, from chaos through a creative process of procreation inside of our mother's womb, we were all formed and the dust that she was eating through the various forms of food become a part of us and a new life is born, um, a state of order, not just random uh, elements of the earth, but organized into this living, breathing, growing daughter or son of God that has capacity. It's beautiful. So out of the dust of the ground, Adam is formed, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, the first flesh upon the earth. The first man also, nevertheless, all things were before created, but spiritually were they created and made according to my word. So naturally people ask the question, well, some scientists think that there were uh, humans before Adam, we have dinosaur bones, or how do we explain all that? I just want to remind everybody, when God revealed the creation story, he wasn't particularly interested in telling the ancient Israelites all about dinosaurs, because frankly, it's irrelevant to their salvation. He wanted to tell them about who he was and who they are. And so we now have all these questions that the creation stories were not designed to answer. Yeah, so the church in in a variety, we've we've had different statements from different leaders through many decades of the church, giving their, their best informed opinions at the time, and that's wonderful. One of the most recent statements that we have in print from the church comes actually from the New Era magazine for youth back in February of 2016 when in their section, I have a question, the question they asked that month was, what about dinosaurs? And here was the answer printed in that February 2016 edition. Did dinosaurs live and die on this earth long before man came along? There have been no revelations on this question, 
and the scientific evidence says yes. You can learn more about it by studying paleontology, if you like, even at church-owned schools. The details of what happened on this planet before Adam and Eve aren't a huge doctrinal concern of ours. The accounts of the creation in the scriptures are not meant to provide a literal scientific explanation of the specific processes, time periods, or events involved. I think that's beautiful where, where, at least in that statement from the church, it's this idea of there are a lot of questions to be explored and they're not of huge doctrinal concern to us because our story picks up when Adam and Eve, the first children of our heavenly parents to have the spirits that lived up in heaven with God come down into their tabernacle of clay, that's when we pick up our story and anything that happened on the earth or in parts of the earth previous to that event, it's of no major doctrinal concern to us. Let me actually build on what we've said before. Imagine this theater metaphor. Let's say there were a whole bunch of stories that played out on that theater before God says, I'm actually now going to play out the plan of salvation. I mean, it's not the perfect analogy, but it might be interesting to learn about all those other things. And personally, I'm fascinated by paleontology and geology, and you and I have spent a lot of time in the great wonders of uh, the American West, the national parks. There's so much beauty and joy there. We don't have to get ourselves all tied up in knots like, how's it all fit together? They just focus on Jesus revealed himself, we stick with him, and he can save us. So the, the same year, 2016, in October of that year, in the New Era, the church um, published this question, what does the church believe about evolution? That's a big question in this science versus religion debate that's gone on for centuries. And here was their answer. Once again, New Era, October 2016. Quote, the church has no official position on the theory of evolution. Organic evolution or changes to species inherited traits over time is a matter for scientific study. Nothing has been revealed concerning evolution. Though the details of what happened on earth before Adam and Eve, including how their bodies were created, have not been revealed, our, teaching rega our teachings regarding man's origin are clear and come from Revelation. Quote, before we were born on earth, we were spirit children of heavenly parents with bodies in their image. God directed the creation of Adam and Eve and placed their spirits in their bodies, and we are all descendants of Adam and Eve, our first parents, who were created in God's image. There were no spirit children of Heavenly Father on the earth before Adam and Eve were created. In addition, for a time, they lived alone in a paradisiacal setting where there was neither human death nor future family. They fell from that state and this fall was an essential part of Heavenly Father's plan for us to become like him. So it's important to, to note as we move forward that there are a lot of questions that we still have that the scriptures aren't intending to answer, and the prophets are not saying nobody should look for these answers. They're saying those are questions for scientists to go and explore and figure out. We do, we, it's not in the revealed word, many of those issues. So, but what we do know is Adam and Eve are God's first children on this earth. They're not creations, they're children of God, and that's significant, created in the image of God. Adding to this, imagine you have a tool belt, and the scriptures are part of that tool belt, and you get to a challenge, say it's a scientific question, and you try to use the tool of scriptures, the scriptures may not be designed to answer that scientific question. And if you say, well, I'm getting rid of the scriptures because that tool doesn't work for this problem, well, gosh, you know, if you need to nail something in but all you have is a screwdriver, you don't throw the screwdriver away simply because the problem at hand, um, you brought the wrong tool to it. Also, just share a couple of other quick things. The word theory actually comes from this ancient word of to see. Theories are explanations to help us better see and make sense of a lot of data. And with more and better data, you can see more clearly. And with better explanations or theories, you can get more accurate um, accurate explanations of how the world works. So we shouldn't be afraid of seeking to understand different theories of how the world works. And then finally, I'll share this. We are taught that all truth will be circumscribed into one great whole. 
And I have taught this to students before that if you find beautiful truth one and beautiful truth two and another truth, all these truths, but maybe some of them don't seem to fit together. It's interesting, if you were playing with a puzzle and found two beautiful pieces, but they didn't go together immediately, would you throw those pieces out? Say, if you did that, you could not complete the puzzle. And I actually had this conversation with my son David about when he was well, about five years ago when he was eight. And I said, David, what would happen if you threw these puzzle pieces out? He said, I'd be angry because I couldn't finish the puzzle. And I said, that's really smart. In my experience in life, people are often angry because they have found religious truth or doctrinal truth and scientific truth. And every now and then they can't make it perfectly fit together and they throw out one or the other. And a lot of people I know who are angry have either rejected science, generally speaking, or rejected religion instead of saying, I'm going to hold on to all the truth until God shows me how it all fits together. God has all truth, all truth. So if we want to be like him, we should pursue seeking all truth. And my personal experience has been there's so much tremendous joy in studying literally everything and holding questions if in your mind, even if you don't have final answers for how things fit together. Keep studying, have faith, keep working at it. Hold on to the most important truths, which is that you are a child of God. But then with that power, you can go out there and learn anything about the world that humanity has ever discovered or God is ready to reveal. Now, look at verse 8, back in Moses chapter 3. He says, I, the Lord God, planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there I put the man whom I had formed. It's kind of fun, just a little trivia thing. Today, when you look at most maps, in our at least in our Western culture, all of our maps are oriented with the wording so that north is at the top of the map. North is is the the uh, top top it's side. It's the cardinal direction. Cardinal direction. In antiquity, often guess which the cardinal direction was? Their map orientation. East. East is at the top in many of them. Not in every case, but in many of them, it's the dominant direction up on up on the top of a map. So it's fascinating that he placed the garden eastward at this top, which creates kind of this feeling in English, the word the fall, it, it really does create kind of this feeling of it's forward and downward into mortality as, they, as they're going to leave the garden. It's just, it's, it's kind of a fun uh, play on, on that directional word there. This is not going to save you, I don't think, but we get that eastward-facing cardinal direction showing up um, in our map still today. So, for example, in, in Hebrew and Arabic, the word for the right hand is Yemen, like in the word son of the right hand, Ben Yamin or Benjamin, and you actually, the farthest right hand or south Arab country is Yemen. It literally means the right, the right or south, because you're facing east, it's as far south or far right as you can go. And actually, the word black, like Black Sea, means north, and the Red Sea means south. That's really how they would distinguish. The Black Sea is the one in the north, and the Red Sea is the one in the south. So, we get, but the cardinal direction again is facing east. So, that's the G Wiz file. If you're playing a celestial bingo, you might be able to win some, some prizes. <laughs> Okay, so now we have Adam created, he's put into the garden in Eden, and out of the ground, verse 9, it says, I, the Lord God, made to grow every tree naturally that is pleasant to the sight of man, and man could behold it. Um, by the way, it, it brings us back yet again to this idea of, that was mentioned over there in chapter 2, verse 26, when this spiritual creation is being laid out, he says, let them, meaning man and woman, have dominion over the fishes of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Again, it comes back to not this um, entitlement idea, but more this uh, caretaking, this stewardship over the earth to, to truly treat the, the, these created elements with respect. 
So we often think about dominating. This word probably would be better translated as stewardship or kingship. Can you imagine any king or queen in their right mind wanting to destroy their kingdom? It doesn't make any sense. In fact, what you want to do is to protect it, to nurture it, to grow it, develop it. So when the Lord tells Adam and Eve and all their descendants, all of us, we have dominion over the world, it's he's giving us divine kingship and stewardship that is our purpose and our function to grow this garden called earth, to not destroy it, to protect it, to take care of it. And the more we do that, it actually creates more order in the world and more opportunities for more people to have thriving lives of joy now and the possibility of salvation in the future. It's beautiful. So now we jump back down in chapter 3 and it says, And it became also a living soul, for it was spiritual in the day that I created it, for it remaineth in that sphere in which I, God, created it, yea, even all things which I prepared for the use of man. And man saw that it was good for food. And I, the Lord God, planted the tree of life also, notice the detail here, in the midst of the garden. The word midst denotes central or middle, the mid part of the garden. He didn't put the tree of life on the outskirts or in the suburbs of Eden. He, he put it downtown in, in this garden. It's in the middle. Well, building upon this, think about temples. Temples are symbolic of that original tree of life. And if you go to Salt Lake City today, the, the temple at Salt Lake City is actually the measurement spot for where everybody else references where they are in the city. And the whole valley, the, the whole Salt Lake the Valley. The entire valley, it's all, even though the temple happens to be geographically way in the north end, you don't have a lot of space north of that, everybody defines where they're at in reference to the center spot, which is the temple, which is symbolically the tree of life, which is God himself. Yeah. Now, the, the fascinating conclusion to verse 9, so, so we go back to where he says that I, the Lord God, planted the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and then you turn the page over and it says, and also the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which really sets the stage for next week in our lesson on the fall, that we don't know if how big the midst of the garden is and what exactly was implied by that, if it, if it meant that they're exactly side by side, right there, smack dab in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil here. But there are some interesting things to note here. Who planted these trees, both of them? I, the Lord God, planted them and he planted them both in the midst of the garden, somewhere, somehow, in, in reference to each other. We don't know, once again. But that's important to note, lest we get the idea that the fall is, is a terrible mistake, that it, it should have never happened and now it forced God into plan B, but to realize, no, it looks like God is setting the stage for phase two of his plan. Phase one was the creation of the earth, and as it's finishing, he then mentions, okay, now we're going to put these two trees and we're setting the stage for something else that was prepared for and mapped out in the blueprint, the master plan, before the foundation of the world even began. God's preparing the way for this fall to occur. Now, will there be consequences that we talk about next week? Absolutely, and we're still dealing with those today. But this was not plan B. Well, notice that God doesn't say a plan of happiness, a plan of salvation. It is the plan of salvation. There's one plan, and he's executing on it, and he's inviting all of us to participate in that grand work. Beautiful. Now, Let's jump down to verse 15. I, the Lord God, took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Similar to what Taylor was talking about before with stewardship, with, with kingship. It's this, the, the dominion isn't to dominate, 
It's to nurture and to bring forth that life. And in this case, living in Eden, it's fairly easy because you don't seem to be having to pull a lot of thorns and weeds and and deal with a lot of critters trying to eat your fruit and your vegetable production. It seems to just grow spontaneously. The word keep we also see in other, lots of places, keep my commandments. It's the same word. It's all about protection. If you're into soccer, there is a goal keeper. And the whole point of the goalkeeper is to protect, protect the goal. To protect the goal. And so that's what the keep means is you want to protect, grow, develop, nurture, and take care of. Now look at the command, verse 16 and 17. I, the Lord God, commanded the man, saying, now notice, notice these, these words, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. What percentage is that, Taylor? Well, remember I told you I didn't do very well in math. <laughs> of every tree, whether you like math or not, this one's pretty simple math. Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. There, there are no electric fences around any of the trees. You, you, you have agency to freely consume fruit off of any of the trees. And then you'll notice the very first word of verse 17. It's a qualifier, but. So what the word but is doing here is it's taking the phrase that came before phrase A, and it's setting up a contrast. In spite of phrase A, you need to watch out for phrase B because there, there are some consequences attached. You're, you're free to eat it, but just know that one of these trees has some, some consequences on it. So what is phrase B? You can eat of every, every tree in this garden, but, verse 17, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Now, if you like marking your scriptures, or if you like annotating them in any way, this, this little marking here in Moses chapter 3 might be helpful to some of you. If you take the word nevertheless, as it appears there in that verse, and you put an open parenthesis right before it, and then go down a few lines and close that parenthesis after it says, forbid it. What you will have now enclosed in a, in a nice little parenthetical statement is the JST addition to the Genesis account. So this phrase does not exist in the Bible. It, the, the way that the biblical account reads, it just starts with, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and uh, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's it. But Joseph Smith, through Revelation, inserts this little phrase, nevertheless, thou mayest choose for thyself, for it is given unto thee, but remember that I forbid it. Now you're noticing that the word nevertheless is semi-related to the word but, because it connects two phrases, and it's kind of a in spite of phrase A, B is going to happen, or despite A, B. But nevertheless is a little even more forceful, it's a little stronger, it's three words, never, the, less. In English we could also say always, the, greater. Well, what is always the greater if nevertheless is sitting here as the connecting word? Always the greater is what comes next. It's phrase B. It's that which follows. So now in that context, look at phrase A. Of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. That's phrase A. Don't eat that fruit. And then the word nevertheless, now put greatest, greater emphasis on what follows. Thou mayest choose for thyself, for it is given unto thee. So, stop and think about that for a minute. What would happen on Mount Sinai if carved into stone by the finger of God, you get wording like, thou shalt not kill. Nevertheless, thou mayest choose for thyself, for it is given unto thee, but remember that I forbid it. What just happened to that command in your mind? Or, thou shalt not commit adultery. Nevertheless, thou mayest choose for thyself. 
it, it feels like this qualifier to the commandment where it's putting a greater emphasis on choice, on agency. You get to decide. But when you make that decision, no, there are going to be consequences. I'm not taking those consequences away. There will be, there will be some natural things that happen, um, but it's your choice. You get to decide. I don't know of any other commandment in all of Scripture anywhere in our entire canon where you get God commanding something in the thou shalt or the thou shalt not format where he instantly, like right immediately after giving the, the direct command, this is the only place in Scripture right here, Moses chapter 3, where I can find a nevertheless qualifying statement to the commandment. He, he doesn't seem to do that, which sets this particular command into a category kind of all by itself, and it's going to come in uh, into play next week when we talk about that decision that they have to make. Knowing there are consequences attached to that tree, they're still going to, to make that decision, and it's fascinating to watch this unfold in chapter 4 as they then interact with the, the fruit of that tree. Now, Let's look at this next segment. He says in verse 18, And I, the Lord God, said unto mine only begotten, that it was not good that the man should be alone. Wherefore, I will make an help meet for him. We often put those two words together and say them as if it's the same word, help meet. Or we call it help mate. mate. And actually that is totally Incorrect. <laughs> the wording there is, I'm going to make a help for the man Adam, that is, meet for him. Or equal and corresponding. Corresponding, complementary, and it's not, I love, I love this, that it's not this kind of a relationship where Eve is going to be beneath him or behind him or over him a relationship where he has a help that is meet for him, M-E-E-T, that is Not sufficient mate. for his, for exactly what he needs, means by implication that he is exactly what she needs, that it's this equal joint partnership, neither the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. I am going nowhere that matters without my angel bride, Kiplin. She's going nowhere that really matters or becoming anything in, in the eternities without me as we move together. And for some people, that is beautiful doctrine. For others, that's a, that's a difficult doctrine because they don't have this marriage in this life. And it's, it's painful for people who have either never been married or who have been divorced. So we know that life is not easy. Many of us have been single. Many of us have lost spouses to divorce or to death. And God knows where we're at. He understands loss and he can be with you and support you in that long night or those long years of suffering. So let's talk about namings again, it, it, the power of names. Notice how God sets up this creation story around names. Verse 20, Adam's given this divine power of naming, which gives him responsibility and authority over these things, but more importantly, identifies their purpose and function. From an ancient Israelite perspective, things come into existence when they get a name. But notice that there was no, nothing that was equal and corresponding to him that actually had yet been named. And so it's got to be brought forth. And you get this interesting experience where God puts Adam to sleep and he takes this rib and from the rib creates a woman. Now, there's been a lot of speculation about what this all means. It turns out in the ancient Israelite world, most people were illiterate. They actually would hear the scriptures read to them or sung to them. And the ancient inspired prophetic writers would often use... Um, literary special effects to help make the story more memorable and actually to point out key themes. And names was were often the lesson. 
And it turns out that the underlying phrase for rib that shows up in other languages in the surrounding cultures actually means woman or life. So there's actually this wordplay. How do you tell people, well, first of all, a rib, you know, we're equal right here, side by side at the rib. But you, so that's that visual that nobody could miss, but also the fact that in the ancient languages, the word rib was actually the same word for woman or life. And so it's like this identification that, that life comes from women and men and women are equal, equal at the rib. And ancient readers would have heard this and would have delighted in the wordplay and in the naming that woman is the source of life. And actually Eve's name in Hebrew means life, for she is the mother of all living. Yeah, isn't that fascinating as we look back really quickly to the very last verse of chapter 2, that at the end of all the creation, those six days of creation, it says, I, God, saw everything that I had made, and behold, all things which I had made were very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Not just good, like it was on the other days, but very good. And it's only very good once he's created the man and the woman, in verse 27, in the image of God. Among all these other things, then it becomes very good. Um, so Moses' uh, story of the creation, it, it has set the stage beautifully, this creation, for next week's lesson on the fall, which then sets the stage for subsequent lessons on the infinite atonement, because without the creation you can't have the fall, and without the fall there's no need for an atonement. So it all lines up beautifully for us, these big pillars of eternity, these big doctrines. So as we put Moses on hold and flip over to Abraham, chapter 4 and 5, let's just point out a couple of little um, significant additions that, again, if we're using the theater analogy, this would be where this particular director and, and stage um, manager have put together some, some unique twists to this story. One of them, right out of the, the shoot, right at the beginning, is the who. And actually, let me who build we're up, talking about. Let me build on that briefly. If you've actually gone to the theater and you're going to see the same play again, it's interesting if a director does things just a little bit different, it catches your attention and you pay attention and the message re registers. But if it's just always the same story again and again, w without any kind of like attempt to try to get your attention, you may miss elements of the instructional purpose of what's happening. Yeah. So notice as you begin verse 4, or chapter 4, verse 1, then the Lord said, let us go down, and they went down from at the beginning, and they, that is, the gods, organized and formed the heavens and the earth. So, verse 1, we haven't, we've, we've just barely gotten into Abraham's account of the creation, his production, his, his stage play, so to speak, and you have the element here of the name of God, Elohim, which Joseph Smith makes a really uh, big deal of towards the end of his life, is that this isn't a singular person, it's plural. In the Hebrew, when you put that, that I am ending, it becomes more than one, and it's the gods who, and you'll notice he didn't use the word created, as it was in Genesis and Moses, it's organized that he formed and organized and formed the heavens and the earth. So they then organize and formed the heavens and the earth. Another one, he talks about this creative process that kind of denotes less of an event and more of a process, that it took time. How much time? We have no idea because the scriptures don't give us an exact timestamp uh, based on uh, what prophets and apostles, like Elder McConkey earlier that we mentioned, refers to this idea of it's however much time is needed to accomplish that purpose. Look at verse 18. 
so here we are at the ending of day four in the Abraham account, and he says, and the gods watched those things which they had ordered until they obeyed. So it's that idea of you don't just make the command and then walk away, you make the command and you watch until it's exactly like you want it to be. Then you say, it is good. It's finished. What a great principle for parenting, that you don't just give commands and then walk away, but you give commands and you watch until you're obeyed, and you work with, and you mold, and you shape over time. It's a process. Raising children is a, is a long process. It's not an event. And discipleship is a process. It's not an event. You can take this same idea not just with other people, but with yourself on the covenant path. You can watch elements of your soul that you're trying to work with the Lord to refine and to become who you, who you aren't yet, and you can keep working at those things. It's a noble wrestle that you keep working at it until those elements obey. That's how you form habits that are good. That's how you learn to play an instrument or learn to play a sport or learn to dance or learn a new skill is you practice and practice and practice and you mess up until you've practiced so much that the elements obey. They, they do what you want them to do without having to think about it and, and put in great effort. Now, you'll notice another thing in here, a phrase that keeps coming up over and over again in Abraham chapter 4 is this phrase, after his kind or after their kind. And so you get all of these animals that are created and the plants that are created, and you come down in 24 or 25, after their kind, after their kind. And then you get to verse 26, and the gods took counsel among themselves and said, let us go down and form man in our image after our likeness. That's a, in contrast to this repeating phrase over and over and over again of after their kind or after its kind, back to what we talked about before, it's just this reiteration that your first views of the divine are probably going to come to you with little glimpses and little flashes in the mirror where you see elements of the divine in your countenance and with other people where you you see things, you experience things, you, you feel of God's love and kindness through other people, and it's this flash. The thing that is so amazing about those experiences isn't that that person's amazing, it's that that person is in that moment, in that action, reflecting the divine image of God, the likeness and the attributes of God. In a small way, you're experiencing, you're tasting of the goodness of God. And sometimes you see it in yourself, many times you see it in other people, and it's beautiful as that process continues to move forward. It's a process of creation. So for, for us, what we're saying is, yeah, the creation of the heavens and the earth, it's amazing, and we're not taking anything away from that, but the fact is, is your heavenly parents are still creating to this day. What are they creating? they're creating more and more and more of their attributes in you as you continue to move forward on this covenant path and trust in the Savior. I love that. So here we are on week number two of this new Old Testament study year. Um, our invitation as you begin this long journey of not just study, but another year's journey of discipleship on the covenant path. Who knows the struggles, the, the difficulties, and the setbacks that we're going to experience this year, either individually or collectively. Uh, but as long as we keep our eye focused on the God who gave us life, the creator of the heavens and the earth, as long as we let him prevail in our life, 
It doesn't matter what's coming our way. As long as we're with the Savior and as long as we stick together in faith, we will move forward, being able to endure not just to the end, but being able to endure every day to come unto Christ, who is the beginning and the end of all things that are worth having. He lives, he loves us, and he came to save us, and he's very good at what he does. And we leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Know that you're loved. And spread light and goodness.